In historic news, Joe Biden has dropped out of the race. But what does this all mean? And how should you feel about it? President Joe Biden has just announced that he is dropping out of the 2024 presidential race. In a stunning letter that was just released moments ago by his campaign on X, formerly known as Twitter, Biden wrote, quote, that it has been the greatest honor of my life to serve as your president. And while it has been my intention to seek reelection, I believe it is in the best interest of my party and the country for me to stand down and to focus solely on fulfilling my duties as president for the remainder of my term. He goes on to say that he will speak to the nation later this week in more detail about his decision. Just a stunning announcement from President Joe Biden that he intends to step down as a candidate in the 2024 election. You know, on the internet, there's some of the greatest memes you've ever seen before, but we're not talking about memes. We're going to be analyzing what this all means, guys. Yeah, we got to talk about it. Andrew, just take a look at the things that happened over the past two weeks, Andrew. Former president indicted. Former president convicted. Supreme Court rules the president has immunity. The worst debate ever. Then there was a failed assassination attempt. Hulk Hogan popped up, and then Joe Biden has now dropped out, endorsed Kamala, but Obama hasn't, and literally people have given up hope on the left oh man guys lots to talk about here i know it's political season because the election's coming up in november and this has just been one big drama i swear there's gonna be a lot of movies and documentaries made about this time who knows a whole drama series is gonna be inspired by this because this is uh, insane, unheard of. American politics is a theater. I actually think people are beginning to get so much fatigue. They're almost like, stop. Like, like it's not even over yet, and they're already uh, not following it anymore. Oh, my gosh. And then the Simpsons memes are coming out of like, oh, Kamala wore the same thing as Lisa Simpson did when Lisa Simpson actually took over presidency from Donald Trump and the Simpsons, which is eerily, you know, but, you know, I think the Simpsons are just really good at uh, kind of predicting the trends. Right. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications. Check out Smalasos at Smalasos.com. It's on Amazon right now. Free shipping. Andrew, a lot of people are even saying who's going to be her VP pick. Is it going to be Mark Kelly, who actually looks like a cop version of Jeff Bezos? Is it going to be Josh Shapiro? Or is it going to be Pete Buttigieg? A lot of people don't know. But here's the thing, Andrew. I, you know what I've been noticing? There's a lot of people having emotional reactions to this, but nobody's actually peeling back the layers. I mean, there's obviously some people pe peeling back the layers, but what should actually people be thinking about if they actually care about this beyond the memes? Mm, well, we're going to get into that, David. All right, point number one, Andrew. Bush... Clinton and Biden have been involved in everything in American politics at the highest levels for almost 50 years. What does that mean? So, right. so, so look at this chart of how you're saying a, a Bush person, a person with the last name Bush of the Bush family, a Clinton, whether it's Hillary or Bill, and Joe Biden has been part of the presidency for almost 50 years because, Andrew, Bush Sr. was a VP. Then Bush Sr. was a president. Then it went to Clinton for eight years. Then it went to Bush Jr. Then it went to Obama with Biden as his VP. And then it went back to, yeah, like basically on the ticket. Like not necessarily that they won every time, but they were literally neither number one or number two for 50 years. And I think that this just came out, Andrew, and a lot of people are questioning now, was American, uh, democracy for the past 50 years essentially an aristocracy mm. basically oh. somebody's saying they're all cousins and a lot of people are saying well what if they ran michelle obama this year as the vp then it would bring the obamas into this right 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 so i guess what i'm saying is it goes to show you that a lot of the stuff at the ultra high peaks of american power it was just a few families. Right, right, right. Now, if that was done on purpose or done because they are the deepest in the system and people are already familiar with them, I think that's part of it. Right. I mean, Andrew, the NBA is kind of coming, like, becoming like this right now, right. where all the NBA players are sons of NBA players. Well, I think when you have multiple generations of people involved in things, there is some slight nepotism, of course. And so, yeah, it definitely looks weird. Right. And people are familiar with the last name. The American voters, typically, I looked at a lot of charts, are viewed as very emotional, very celebrity-driven. They become celebrity families. Same with the Kennedys, too, right? Number two, Andrew, everybody, 
is literally talking about the deep state versus the permanent state versus the administrative state or the bureaucratic state. These right. are all names with different connotations and energies describing the same thing. Do you think it's uh, important for people to think about the deep state? Do you think like, because it, it seems like a real thing. I mean, essentially what people are describing is all these industrial complexes, all these corporations, these very rich people. It doesn't have to be the Illuminati in some weird, dark, cloak right. type meeting right. way, but they are essentially running things. I think that what you are referring to is the modern definition of deep state. Typically, it was in the past called the bureaucratic state, where it was just 40,000 nonpartisan government jobs that are decision makers that don't really get swapped out with the president. Right, like the head of the CIA, head of the FBI. These are not things that change right. along with the president. Supreme Court. They only right. get appointed by the president when they're up, when someone else retires. So this has become the central focus, Andrew, not just because Donald Trump always talks about the deep state, but it's because there's a Project 2025, mm -hmm. which is basically going to take some thousands of nonpartisan government jobs, but make them potentially more partisan. Because there's only 4,000 that are partisan yeah. right now. There's 50,000 that are nonpartisan, but it would take, I believe, another 15,000 and make them more partisan. Because right now, a lot of people are saying on both sides, but more so on the right, that the government is moving too slow. So even when they win the presidency, nobody can get anything major done mm -hmm. because everything is so bureaucratic and moves so slow. But here's the thing, Andrew, when you call it the deep state, you're referring it to it with a much more nefarious energy and connotation than all the way to permanent state, a little bit less, administrative state, all the way to bureaucratic state. Right. Doesn't the bureaucratic state sound way more benign? Yeah. Oh yeah, hey, you know, whoa, I don't know about this deep state, but I'm okay with the bureaucratic state. Right, so basically people are trying to speed up the mechanisms of government, which have traditionally in America designed by the people who designed the American government a few hundred years ago to be very slow. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short is, is the deep state almost just meaning more of the CIA now than all these bureaucratic positions, which is like the EPA and stuff like that. It's very interesting. You guys, these are just the real things that people actually should be talking about. Like if, if Project 2025 goes through, is it nefarious or is that, are they just trying to speed up government? That's something that people got to think about. Point number three, Andrew, a lot of traditional Democrat voters, namely people who are of ethnic minority background, they are very sick, at least on the internet, of being told that they have to vote for the left because the right is racist. Right. I mean, I guess, and this is coming because, you know, Kamala is half uh, Jamaican and half Indian. And, uh, you know, obviously people are going to peg her as like the black candidate. Vote for the black woman. Vote for the black woman. Vote for the Asian woman. They're going to say Kamala, they're, for the Asians, they're going to say, hey, Kamala could be the first Asian American pre right. female president or first Asian American president ever and the first female president and she could also be the first black woman president and she would also be the first one i believe without her actual children more stepchildren right, right? Now, and, so but is it interesting that she actually complexion wise looks like barack yeah, yeah. skin tone like wise, like, yeah. like but i mean if barack was the first black president then i guess judging by the same metrics of blood you would say she's also gonna be she's also the first black woman right 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 um so basically, a lot of people are discussing right now, Andrew, is the Republicans still the white party and the Democrats still the POC party? Or is it changing now because there's actually a lot of elite Indians that are like, uh, you know, like from very prestigious backgrounds fitting into the right side? Yeah, no, there are a lot of prominent Indian Republicans, which is interesting to me. Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, and the wife of J.D. Vance. Usha, Usha Vance. Usha Vance is... Uh, she, all and, and they are from elite backgrounds, too. Yeah, they're typically. all from good backgrounds, of course. But I'm like, I guess, man, Indians Indians love politics, I guess. All right, here, here's my general breakdown from a very hyper-Asian perspective, Andrew. I do think that Republicans would be lay, way, way, way less likely than Democrats to acknowledge Lunar New Year. Would you agree with me? Yeah. But I also think that they might be a lot harder on street crime and degeneracy in the streets. Exactly. So, and but I also think Republicans would also use more... I guess, harsher language against China. Yes. So I'm just saying it's like, what, just people are going to vote on their priority. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think either party you can say is categorically more pro-Asian. I mean, I think Democrats in their heart is more like leaning towards helping minorities, but... More culturally sensitive, I guess, to holidays and stuff but like that. But like which party actually helps you more 
I don't think it's really about which party helps the Asians more because how do you help Asians? It's all just comes down to your own personal needs. Right, right, right. Like some people want Lunar New Year to be acknowledged, I guess. Yeah, but also I mean, people are just like, keep my the street that's outside of my small business safe. That's what matters to me. Point number four, Andrew. There's a lot of themes that in America that lead to an alternation between two parties. For example, Andrew, since I believe, I want to say 1943, the American presidency, for the most part, has just alternated between Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. And basically, the reason why it's alternated, and there's no real science behind it, is because generally, American voters, have, there's a lot of studies on this, have been shown to be very emotional. And basically, when a party is in power for four to eight years, uh, basically, you could say they've been in control, but a lot of people become unhappy at the end of the eight years with the flaws. So basically... The other party that's campaigning against the current incumbent party gets to sell that they'll fix the flaws. Exactly. Because honestly, generally, I just feel like everybody, when a president is finally gone, they all just think about all the negatives. You mean they like everything that they didn't the, do? or Like the vibe when Obama was in president for eight years, the vibe... I'm not saying he accomplished everything he said he was going to, but the vibe was good. And then when he left, then everybody started looking at the flaws of Obama. Ah, Obama wasn't that good of a president. Ah, he didn't he used drones, right? Or ah, he, 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 didn't, he, didn't, he didn't fix as much as he said. He still did everything that any normal uh, president would do. And then, so then now everybody, now Obama's legacy is now known as like not that good of a president, which I think, whatever is fair or whatever, but I'm just saying the vibe changes once they leave. Right, right, right. Like, everybody was like, man, I love the vibes when he's here later. Uh, what did he really get done in comparison to what I thought? And then, um, basically, also, voters, Andrew, are way more, and this is a psychological thing, way more likely to vote against someone than for someone. Yeah. So you know how everybody always said love is stronger than hate? But when at least it comes to voting, Andrew, statistically, it has been shown hate is stronger than love. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Definitely hate is a stronger feeling. Point number five, Andrew. Do you think, and this is an interesting discussion that nobody's debating right now because people are still just caught up in memes, not what it means. Is Trump a different, potentially more chilled out person after the failed assassination attempt, whether you believe it was legit or not legit? I think he will be a little bit. And I hope so because I do think Trump needs to calm down. And I guess maybe it was humbling a little bit. You know what I mean? Right. Do you think it's possible, I have this theory, that once Trump finally wins, right, he can't win anymore, he's going to go, you know, I, I just do what I think. I'm part of the Trump party. You know, I won as a Republican, but there's a lot of things like abortion the Republicans are against. I don't, you know, I support it low-key, but I won now so I can say what I truly think. Oh, definitely, dude. Trump, of all people, likes probably likes himself an abortion. Right. Yeah, he's probably with it. I mean, that... Just knowing how he is. He yeah. seems like a bro who's down for the abhor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it, it, I think it'll be interesting to see if he flips on Republicans even once he wins. Because he, he, Andrew, I believe Donald Trump more than anything just, just wants to do what he wants to do. Right, he does right. not he, care about any of the other He ain't shows. really like down with all the, it's just like him and his fan base. It's almost like. Well, he's he, just trying to win, right? No, he's almost like an independent artist that's like, he just wants to bring his fan base along with him it's not really he's not really held back by the label he's a little bit like kanye like he'll violate the people who love the soul samples by just saying some crazy ish uh point number six the news cycle is hyper hyper quick nowadays andrew if a failed assassination attempt that ha uh, happened on a president in the 1990s do you think people would be talking about it for like six months yeah no i think the whole world is still talking about it but now so many things happen it's like are we even thinking about his assassination attempt anymore? I mean, I guess if he had gotten actually shot, like it actually hit some real meat on his body, I guess it would have made a bigger uh, a head, like we would be talking about it more. But like now it's, I don't know. I feel like it's almost like people are done talking about it in like another week from now. Yeah, literally the news cycle is hyper, hyper quick now. It's got like the life of a mayfly. Point number seven, Andrew. Do you think that anybody's just going to talk about how it looks like an easy win for Trump? Like, if you, you may, you know what the Vegas odds are for Kamala right now? They're around 30%. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that there's all these memes saying that Trump getting the presidency is like the Celtics winning the championship this year in 2024. Cakewalk. Mm. And basically, a lot of all these memes are coming out. It just feels like a lot of people on the left are giving up on Kamala. Right, yeah. That's I mean, how it feels. I mean, she doesn't poll very well. Not that many people are familiar with what she's been doing. 
She doesn't have a great highlight tape. Uh, I would say, obviously, President Obama, who is also half black, has not endorsed her yet, which is kind of like shows you something, uh, hints at something. But yeah, I mean, overall, dude, I don't think that many people are excited about Kamala. I mean, I think people are still going to be voting against Trump. So they might they're going to vote for Kamala just to vote against Trump, but no one's really excited about Kamala. What is up with these presidential kids nowadays? I mean, this is uh, Kamala's stepdaughter. I guess very, uh, they call her the queen of Bushwick. Uh, obviously, Hunter had his troubles. Donald Trump Jr. seems like he was like super broed out. He's literally giving interviews about if Diddy killed Kim Porter. Literally, Donald Trump's son gives interviews about Diddy. So I'm just saying, whatever happened to like Chelsea Clinton sort of staying out of the news, Andrew, even... Andrew, nowadays, what the presidential kids do, it makes what the Bush daughters did, which is like drink alcohol before they were 21, look like absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it just goes to show you what people cared about. But do you think, Andrew, that the wins that the Democrats overall did have, whether it was forgiving student debt, affordable medic, uh, medicines, CHIPS Act, infrastructure bill, will people even care about these? Or is it all about narratives about people not liking Kamala? Or will people go by like, oh, well, they accomplished this and this and this. Because I know you are of the mind that people don't give Biden any credit for what he did do. Yeah, I mean, I generally believe that Joe Biden's administration, maybe not Joe Biden himself, but I feel like what they accomplished was better than what people give him credit for. They, you know, he, the unemployment, certain things, you know, did well, but they're over, they get overrided by emotional issues and everyday issues that affect everyday lives which is like immigration, crime, uh, inflation, those three things. Like even if some parts of the economy are doing really well right now under Biden, but then some parts are not, people are just really going to judge them on the fact of how it affects their own life, which I don't blame them. I don't blame people because your own life is your own life. But there are certain things that were done that were good and just certain things that were not good. And then also the two wars popped off. So ultimately those things define Biden and the presidency as not as productive. Right, right, right. What you're referring to are issues that emotionally or on a real level feel visceral to people. By the way, he also had the Senate and the Congress at the same time to pass a lot of laws. That's generally what you need because there's a systems of chess and balances. There's a president, the Senate, the Congress. It's all got to work together, guys. If you guys, you know, just remember from politics 101 in high school, but to be honest, I do not think a lot of Americans do remember. Point number eight, Andrew. What else is going to happen potentially over the next three months? Literally, so much just happened over the previous three months. What's still going to happen? Do you know what some people theorize? That Trump could have a heart attack because he eats a very bad diet full of American fast food, which he's known to have a deep love for. So some people are saying now it's going to flip on Trump for him being too old or in bad health. Yeah, well, the joke is Biden used to be the oldest. And now that Biden's out of the race, Trump is officially the oldest presidential candidate or Republican candidate ever. No, I believe the Republicans secretly are also, they're planning their backup candidates. Yeah, Trump seems healthier than Biden, let's be honest, you know. But, uh, and I think Biden's cognitive decline, honestly, was a little bit sharper than everybody thought. So that was a little it, bit It fell off. It, I guess it was a lot quicker or accelerated maybe than people thought. Point number nine, Andrew. A lot of people are saying, why does the election every four years literally come down to about 60,000 people in the Midwest? Mm -hmm. Literally. Uh, it always comes down to five or seven swing states, but a lot of those counties in those swing states are already strong, red or blue, one way or another, right? Usually it's a rural urban split. The rural centers tend to be more blue. The rural centers uh, tend to be more red. So literally, Andrew, the entire election, every year of America comes down to 60K people in literally, Andrew, I saw analysis, 15,000 people in Wisconsin. 15,000 people in Wisconsin win every single time. They decided. And I'm saying that if you look at Wisconsin, Andrew, they're the people who got left out of the technocratic boom of the Teslas and the NVIDIAs. So that's why Trump's VP pick, J.D. Vance, even though it's a lot of, of questions of, about how truly hillbilly he really is, that's going to appeal to those Wisconsin people who identify as a hillbilly. Yep. So take that for what it is. If it only comes down to 15K people in Wisconsin, you better get all the country music stars. Right. Point number 10, Andrew, how, why have both parties, both Democrat and Republican, drifted so far from what they were defined by, for example, in 1960? Mm. Andrew, the biggest split used to be between labor unions and ownership. 
and it used to be between big government and little government. And now it seems like it's not about those things anymore at all. Right, right, right. Why is that? I mean, literally, why are there certain issues that are issues, but not the biggest issues in the world, always defining the election and defining the emotions around the election, you know? I think it's interesting that if you study American politics and all these people, they go to like mo most of America is run by lawyers, right? So they study all this history from the 50s, the 40s, the 30s, the 60s, the 70s, where it really was about labor unions versus ownership. And literally it's about none of those things. Those are like fifth tier issues now. So I don't even know if somebody who studies American politics even has a grasp on the 2024 environment because mm -hmm. the demographics have changed so much. What people care about so much has changed. Uh, people's priority lists have shifted and it's all out of whack. And point, Andrew, number 11, something that people should be thinking about, about what it means, M-E-A-N-S, instead of memes, M-E-M-E-S, Andrew, is this Economist article where it says Americans are ultimately going to be okay because even though the election seems so wacky, the, uh, the rock-hard economics and the fact that the U.S. dollar is the default dollar that everybody has to trade in globally keeps everything solid. Yeah, so basically what they're saying is like, hey, guys, I know America seems very divided right now, but the American dollar is strong. People still want to invest in America. America still has a lot of money. America still has the most powerful army. It still has the military on lock. It's still actually really strong. But there are, I would almost use this analogy, David, like the entire body is functioning fine. Like you're not hurt. You're not broken bone. You're not super sick. You're operating, but you got like a stomachache. Right. And you got a bad stomachache, but it might just be diarrhea. America just got diarrhea right now and like like an ear infection. But, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 they're definitely sick. You probably don't want to go to work, but you're functioning. Okay, to me, I think that this is the biggest disagreement that nobody's framing this because a lot of people in the Economist uh, Instagram section were roasting the Economist being like, oh, you guys are such a mouthpiece for like UK billionaires that have invested a lot in the US. Of course, you don't care about the day-to-day -day realities on the ground, on the sidewalk here. Right. I'll tell you this, Andrew. Is America more like a Toyota where you know how you can drive a Toyota and not really give it oil changes and it just like runs even if it's all beat up and got dents on it? Or is it more like a BMW? Where literally, if you don't take care of a BMW and feed it premium, it might just stop on you on the road. Mm. Is America more like a Toyota or is it more built like a BMW? You mean at the peak when everything's running well and at the peak and everything's falling into place and all the other countries are falling into place and everything's going well, then America is by far the top. Right. But when those systems start to fail and we're a little bit slow on taking the BMW back to the auto shop, you know, this, you know, get that, that 10,000 mile checkup. And it almost isn't. Then, no. So basically the people who are heavily invested in the economy, they think it's more like a Toyota, but if you're on the social level, Andrew, and you see all this dissension and the arguing at the Thanksgiving dinner table, father and son, daughter, and mother, they don't want to talk to each other over identity politics. You would think it was more like breaking down. I, but I see whereas the point. economist people are thinking it's going to just keep going, even if it looks a little shaky. I see their point. Listen, I think that overall, there's a lot of emotions and a lot of bickering and there is a lot of divisiveness. But I do think the whole thing about civil war is like, it's pretty far from civil war, man. You said that movie that, what was that movie? You yeah, watched, I watched it. Civil, I watched that movie, Civil War. It is a good movie, but it doesn't it really explain how it gets to that point where actually there's like literal states that team up like uh california and texas team up to take over dc to uh, to rebel against that and i'm like and don't all the minorities opt out of it because they don't feel as invested uh, kind of there's like some undertone that a lot of that it's mostly white and some black white white on white war. it's mostly the uh heritage americans and then the asians and like latinos are kind of like <laughs> but anyways uh, regardless, uh, watch the film if you guys get the chance. You know, it's, there's a lot of like little nuggets and interesting stuff there. But I would say ultimately, like, you know, I, I don't think America's super close to civil war. It's really not, man. It's not super close to a hot war with China either, in reality. But that doesn't mean we can't just keep getting things better. I think there is a lot of emotions in the air right now. So people, there does need to be some kumbaya moment or some type of uniting. I don't know if we need like three more rush hour movies and then a bunch of, I don't know what it is, but there needs to be like, it's really not that bad, 
but th- but people need to still focus on getting things better. But I think it's just very emotional. You know what I think? This is my final takeaway. I think that the macroeconomics of the trillion dollar companies have become separated from the concerns of every non-rich person in America. And in the past, the wealth of the average American was going up. The wealth of the average CEO of a multinational was going up and they've started to become decoupled. Mm. And you can argue that it was always by design. It just was lucky to go up together. But it feels like now that the people who are like, running the stock market and stuff like that, all they see is the chart going up. They don't care that the average person's happiness or satisfaction is going down. So now there's like, there was, it used to be correlated and it feels like it's been decoupled where basically the puppet masters care less about the day-to-day concerns of the puppets in this capitalistic milieu. Well, please puppet masters, if you want the puppets to continue to be happy and ignorant, then keep us happy. I don't understand why the people in power didn't just keep us dumb and happy. Look what happens when you flood us all now, all these conspiracy theories and we're unhappy and inflation and new things and things are looking weird. And then people are taking over all these different things. It's Dude, people didn't even care about the alien videos. I don't know if those were real or fake, but they just, the government tried to throw them out there as a little distraction. People didn't even care. They were like, take care of the street outside. Guys, crime, safety immigration, and the economy. That's pretty much what people care about right now. So, All right, everybody, uh, let us know what you think in the comments down below. Yes, like we said, guys, there's so many memes on the internet, but we wanted to break down and peel back the layers of what this all means. Let us know what you guys think of our takeaways. Agree, disagree, supplement, compliment. Until next time, we the Hot Pop Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.